So Quinn, for some time I've been doing this series of interviews that I have called in his own words, in her own words. It's usually the first interview I've done with the individual, but you and I have spoken many times, mm -hmm. of course. I think a lot of people don't necessarily know who you are, what your story is, how you got here. Why don't we start from the beginning, how you got involved in uh, artificial intelligence and the research that you've been doing? Um, my work in uh, computer programming and uh, mainly my focus has been in what's called decision models. I've been doing that since oh, probably the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, I started with it, I found, first found this type of programming when I was doing work for a company called AFSA, Data Corporation, in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the company that uh, handles all the student loans for the United States government. So early on in my career, I had the opportunity in the late 90s to do the Student Loan Disbursement Reconciliation Database I built for AFSA Data Corporation in the late 90s, which gave me exposure to decision model programming. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is it, it's kind of uh, where you take uh, large data, you know, like at the time I would take pretty much every student loan in the country that the federal government would disperse, and I would reconcile that against a disbursement and origination system. So you would have two financial systems, one where the loan would originate from, right, and then one where the loan would disperse from. So these two systems had to maintain a balance. And so I built a system uh, for the student loan governing body that the United States government had hired out to contract to take their process from a 30-day reconciliation where they would reconcile all student loans in the country on a 30 to 60, 90 day basis. Mm -hmm. And I brought them into a semi real time seven day cycle where they could disperse, originate, and reconcile loans for that day on that day. And from that analysis that I did with their people and based on the records, I started learning decision model programming. And you didn't go to college for no. any of this. You're all no. self-taught in terms of programming and everything. Yeah, and the, I learned from the people around me mostly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I got into it. And then uh, from there, I got into building what's called CRM systems, customer which are relationship customer relationship management. management that then led into social networking. Mm -hmm. So all of these systems combined with what's called decision model programming of what are your likes, dislikes, what are you deciding on, Mm -hmm. And these types of programming over the duration of time of a career lead a person into step by step into eventually into artificial intelligence. So when did this all start? When were you first working at that uh, loan company? 1996, okay. 1997. And then I worked for them uh, during the Y2K switch where we were uh, handling making sure all the student loans in the country were correct at the Y2K flip. Right. And then right after 9-11, I lost my contract because of the Patriot Act to continue government contracts. You had to meet certain requirements that I didn't meet. Mm -hmm. So right at 9-11, I was in New York holding meetings with all of the student loan banks, Bank of America, mm -hmm. uh, just a few months prior to 9-11. And then right after 9-11, I got out of the government sector and started going into the more private sector dealing with hospitals, working with people like Nike, working with people like uh, PayPal in the past, Hotwire I've done work for, Hewlett Packard. I didn't know you did any work with PayPal. Yeah, I, I used to do some of their mailings from one of their contractors. Hmm. So I've worked with a lot of secondary market contracting agencies to do this work, but I've worked on the systems for Hotwire that would send you out your alerts based on trip preferences. I've worked on the system at H for HP that would uh, promote products to you based on pat machine patterning and purchase history. Mm -hmm. So I've worked on a lot of these really big systems that deal with consumer product data. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it for a lot of years. Now, you and I have had a lot of uh, offline personal conversations. Mm -hmm. And if I get into anything that you don't want to talk about, feel free to tell me that. But you've had 
I mean, people who've been watching for the past couple of days know that you're here in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been quite alone. <laughs> So you've got kind of an unusual family history. Do you want I to talk do. about that a little um, bit? I don't have much connection with them. Um, my mom is uh, considered the most renowned quilter in the world. She won the National Quilting Award three times, mm -hmm. but won't speak to me. Um, and I'll get into why. Um, and I have had no connection with my family for the last five years. Where did you grow up? Arizona. Phoenix. Really? Yeah. In a more uh, heavily devout Mormon family. Bishops, preachers, everyone goes on their missions, serves God. Did you go on a mission? A no. Mormon? You never did? No. I converted to Buddhism when I was 15. 15. And what was your family's response to that? Uh, not really. Didn't really understand or have any response to it. It was just, you know, more pressure to be a Christian. Were they upset with you when you did uh, that? I think they were disappointed, especially in the Mormon faith, because it, it shows a lack of belief in their way of life. Mm -hmm. And they want everyone in their family circle to believe the same thing and talk about it. I think most this. families do. Yeah, so. What prompted that switch in your mind? Uh, I met a Buddhist monk on a Greyhound bus. Um, mm -hmm. My family had sent me to these uh, seminar training camps in Northern California, which are essentially deep state mine camps, mm -hmm. uh, where they would send adults. They were called Psy Seminars. Uh, it was run by the people that also backed the secret videos, you know, the law of attraction. Uh, so they would send me to these summer training camps for a week every summer. The secret, you mean the book, The Secret? Yeah. yeah. Really? That's yeah. interesting. The secret was actually formed was through a research that. program at a remote location in Northern California from people like Mark Victor Hansen, who made Chicken Soup for the Soul, uh -huh. Bob Proctor, who's a uh, financial uh, motivational speaker for corporations, uh -huh. um, Deepak Chopra, right. uh, the guy who wrote The Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Mm -hmm. um, every year at a ranch in Northern California, these people would meet and conduct a seminar called Principia, uh, you know, the principles. Um, right. And from that, they started forming video series and various books that got published all over the world. Right. And Without obviously, it's ideas. positioned as self help type seminars. It's posed as that way. But what, what it is, is it's a recruiting system. Uh huh. They get you to buy the books, then you buy the books, you find the seminars. Once you find the seminars, you get introduced to a recruiter. Once you get introduced to a recruiter, you get brought into this secret world. And so that was what my family was brought into when I was a teenager. And I ended up eventually being engaged to the daughter of the woman who owned the company, which is how I found out about their Masonic connections, about how the original owner of the company was connected to the CIA through his military background hmm. and all this stuff because I was engaged with the daughter for, Wait, for five so, years. And, and this is the book, The Secret. That's yeah. the... Yeah. The, one of the, the, the original people that did the philosophy were a guy named Thomas D. Wilhite. Uh, Mark, there are a couple other guys that started like companies like Est, Psy Seminars, I've heard of that. Landmark, uh -huh. um, all these personal development cults, essentially, cult, like self help cults, uh, all came out of uh, psychological operation training programs from the government. It's interesting, you know. My so I was involved in that as a teenager and went through their trainings where I would climb up telephone poles and stand on top and jump off and to grab trapezes and. They would hang me off cliffs, uh -huh. and I would do group exercises and do balance beam exercises. This is like trust building exercises. Yeah, do trust fall kind of building exercises, go through group dynamic stuff, and this was all like in my teenage years to early adult years, right before I got into programming. So cult indoctrination, yeah. basically. Yeah, very much. Okay, so you were engaged to the the daughter of the woman who owned the company mm -hmm. and like she was best friends. So you were fast tracked in this thing to the top of the line. Yeah, I was I was fast tracked to the top pretty <laughs> much. And I used to have dinner at, at Spago and have my picture taken with Wolfgang Puck because the person I was with was the godmother to his children. Huh. But you didn't marry this woman. No, I left. Have you ever been married? You left. What prompted you to leave? Um, I didn't want to conform to that way of life. 
What do they want you to do? Um, manipulate people. Mm -hmm. Mostly they to want... To join their thing. The recruit, between the recruitment efforts and the manipulation of people and the, the strict desire for financial gain at any cost, mm -hmm. uh, really just I, I didn't want to be in that environment. The lack of true emotional and, and psychological well-being, these people were a bunch of piranhas. What age was it that you were engaged to this woman? Uh, 18, 19. Wow, very young. Yeah, I was very young. I, I moved out of Arizona to get away and then moved in with her and we got engaged. I got engaged in 1920. And how long early. were you engaged for? A few years, quite oh, a few really? years. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we, we lived together until I was 23, 24. Wow. All right. So what, what caused you to break the engagement and how did you get out of all this? Uh, I just walked away. Um, she, she was nice. But there was always a separation. I was never included. What do you mean? Uh, they would always walk in front of me and talk about things that I wouldn't be privy to. So you weren't, you two weren't in love, or uh, we were, but I was never. It was never really like I was included in their things. Like they would, like she, my fiance would go off to do seminars for a week a month, and I wouldn't see her. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that wasn't. I One week per month, every month? Yeah, she would disappear for a week every month um, and do these training and indoctrination seminars at this company in Northern California. And, um, I, you know, it was just the way they did things. And so uh, over time, it became more the, of them pushing me to go through their indoctrination seminars than it was to have a relationship. And what did that indoctrination seminar, what, so that's the standing on the poles and jumping? No, it was beyond that. The, the company does it through stages where you get introduced by a friend. Mm -hmm. The friend introduces you to their basic seminar, their basic introductory offering. Then from there you go to a seven day training to break you down where they isolate you away from your family and friends at a remote location. And then after the seven day training of getting you familiar with their philosophies and practices, they separate you into male and female dedicated groups mm -hmm. where they put you through what's called leadership training and take you through extreme exercises in relation to various aspects of your personality. Uh, most people come out and find they are totally different people. When you say extreme exercises, what, what extremities, what um, do they do? Sending you out into the forest with very little food and water, to survive, um, having you potentially go to undisclosed locations for periods of time where you're unfamiliar with the environment and you have to increase your survival abilities spontaneously. Hmm. Uh, that's a lot of what their training is really about is to force you to increase your spontaneous survival skills. Wow. All right. So you left. Mm -hmm. This was a cult, basically, and a lot of what you described there, I think, sounds like pretty standard cult. But the people involved was large groups of people. It was called large group awareness training. So it wasn't like the same 50 people in a cult. Every month it was a new 100 people. Hmm. And this company has trained millions of people. Wow. All over the world. So it's, it's not like an isolated cult that has a ranch where 50 or 60 people give up their life savings and go to it. Right, like Branch Davidian this or something is, like this that. This is a business where hundreds of thousands of people revolve through a door of training and get indoctrinated and they get special rings and necklaces. And it's the building of a, of a network. Interesting. Of individuals. All right. So you left about the age of 24. 23, 24 and you went into the world of programming. Yeah. How did they I already feel? was there, I just went more into it. Okay, but you left this sort of religious... Uh, well, they weren't religious, they were just greedy. I see. Yeah, anything to make a dollar. So it was just a cult, it was just a, some sort of a fraternal order. Yeah. And you left. And how did they respond to you leaving? Uh, this communication, like, you know, just didn't communicate with me. And they just said, Psh. Yeah. Go. They but I've, I've ran into them at strange times in my life where I've been at like beaches and stuff and they've pulled up in their cars and appeared out of nowhere. People you know. that you remember from the group? Yeah, even my ex-fiance showed up in one location I was at one time. What did she say to you? 
oh, what a surprise to see you. What are you doing here? And I was like in some remote beach location. Uh, it happens quite often with the people in their group. What do you think her purpose was in doing that? Maybe it was just coincidence, maybe not. I don't know. I generally don't think too much about it. Okay. But it just happens a lot where I've interacted post with these people. And one of the people in the group, uh, when I was 18, attempted to recruit me into a program as well. What kind of program? A program where you go through higher levels of training uh, that involves celebrities, involve people of certain wealth status. Mm -hmm. Um, I was made aware of the Deep State program when I was 18, so I've known about it for many years. How were you made aware of it? Uh, they recruited, tried to recruit me. Through I mean, what were the friends. details they uh, A friend you? of mine at the time who I had met through this seminar company, uh, when I was moving from Phoenix to Los Angeles to live with the daughter, uh -huh. I was, had a friend in the car who was also a part of the seminar group. Right. And during the isolated trip between Phoenix, Arizona and Los Angeles, uh, she had told me about her involvement with these people previously, but more specifically during this trip was when they had tried to attempt to recruit me and, and get me to be able to join their group and told me about their secret clandestine operations, uh, told me about how they use actors and celebrities for distractions, hmm. uh, told me about what they controlled and how they're teaching people to do things. What did they tell you about secret clandestine operations? Uh, that they used uh, celebrities to enhance energy and that they were running operations behind the scenes while they would travel around with celebrities to uh, do certain operations. To they just get money or what was the purpose of the Gain money, operations? wealth, influence, power, uh, status. Mm -hmm. um, no one really knew what their motives were uh, but now it, it's to me it's kind of clear it's just to control the indoctrination or the, the way of the people into the future. You, you want people to be like you. And so like things like um, words like synergy mm -hmm. uh, are words they used to use in these programs. So every time I see the word synergy, I know it's one of them. Well, but synergy is also a word that... But it wasn't used before they brought their programs out. Well, what do you mean? How, how could that be? Synergy is combination of two things, I mean, that's a pretty standard word. It is, but the first place it was ever used was in these programs that I ever heard it. Okay, got it. And I heard it in the mid-90s. So this phrase of synergistic living and, you know, to think is to create, these uh, psychological programs were first created in these large group awareness trainings. Okay. And to your knowledge, are these things connected with the military? I mean, you said it's deep yeah, state. Yeah, I, I went through trainings with several military people, Navy SEALs. Uh, a lot of people were in uh, executive status in corporations. Um, what was the nature of the training you did with uh, these Navy SEALs? The nature SEALs? of the training that where I went through that where the Navy SEALs and the corporate executives were at. Yeah was the seven-day training, which was the psychological breakdown. Survival and survival, stuff. Survival, reestablishment, the one where they would get you to climb the poles and the walls and hang off cliffs and get you to really get outside of your natural element. Okay. And to reshape your perceptions, as they would say. Reshape how you see things, reshape the way you make your decisions, and reshape the people you would keep in your life to where they would almost get you to be like a recruiter for them to bring your friends in. Well, I've heard that many times before, that mm -hmm. cults try to kind of reprogram people's brains and turn them into drones to, so that the leaders of the cults can gain wealth and all that kind of thing, so. But this is more than a, a cult from what I saw. Like, because this is, this, these groups of people aren't religious based and they've been operating on the long term, Right. it's more of a, appears to be a a uh, covert fraternal order of people who subscribe to the same life philosophy and everyone else doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. And so you believe that some version of this cult or some similar type of operation is taking action against you right now? Uh, I've found that they're, based on my research, there's several groups that are operating in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. And this is, to my knowledge, and training, this is what they do to people they don't want to reveal their secrets. What is what they do? Uh, disinformation, slander. Uh, I'm not saying the, the sonic weapons. The, I'm only relating that because of what I've been finding in the news. Right. 
recently in Loose Connections, but I'm talking in the way that uh, uh, some people respond to us on the internet right. are indicative of one of their operations. But we've, we've seen, of course, um, well, there was that uh, documentary about uh, Scientology, I forget what it was called, mm -hmm. on HBO. Obviously, people know about Scientology. We've heard about the Branch Davidians. There's, uh, you know, a tremendously mm -hmm. long list of cults. You've spoken about secret societies. I think we're fleshing this idea out a little yeah. bit more. And, and that's what I'm trying to do is, you know, a lot of people, I think, hear some of the things that you say and some of the ideas and theories that you put far forward. far And they find them a bit fantastic, a bit far-fetched, as you would say. But you can go to SciSeminars.com, P-S-I-S-E-M-I-N-A-R-S.com. You can go look at their teen experience seminar, hmm. and you can see the exact seminar that I led other teens through, and you can see the other trainings that they offer people. You can see there's no pictures of the people that run the operation. Hmm. You go to SciSeminars.com, you can look at that. It looks like a psychological operations center. Sci, psychological, that is the main motive and they operate with the people that made the secret video because the people that are in the secret video also have videos on their website promoting their offerings. Mm -hmm. So you can go and look it up yourself. Mm -hmm. You can cross check it. I went to these seminars in the mid 90s when I was 15 years old, my parents sent me to them. Mm -hmm. I have photographs of me being on top of poles, I have photographs of being hung off cliffs, I have photographs of group exercises. Um, well, I can't imagine it's difficult for people to at least visualize mm -hmm. and, and realize that what we're talking about, these are real things. The book, The Secret, uh, you know, cults, and fraternities. The, the guy who's at the beginning of The Secret, Bob Proctor, who's the deep voice guy, Yeah, he was specifically one of my trainers. What's your impression of him? He knows how to make money and influence people. He's a little known fact about him is he was a Canadian yo-yo champion. Why is that significant? Because it shows his drive. He still uses that as part of his sales shtick when he does a seminar. Interesting. Pulls out a yo-yo to impress you with his yo-yo tricks. Does it work? Every time. Wow. Guy must be quite good with a yo-yo. He is. Hmm. But he's better at explaining why the yo-yo is important to financial future. Well, we'll leave that to him. one of his seminars, but okay. So you, at a very young age, were aware of these secret societies, these, these cults, these fraternities, whatever we want to call them. And obviously they uh, span a wide range. We've spoken about Scientology. Now, there's also- I used to also work for the company that installed the first connected networks at the main church of Scientology in LA. Right across the street from Birds, an excellent yeah. uh, roasted chicken restaurant. Yeah, so I forget I've the name of that road. What's the street that it's on there? It's on L. Ron Hubbard Boulevard, I think. No, it's the uh, Hollywood, the one right in Hollywood. Franklin. It's on Franklin yeah. Boulevard, isn't it? Maybe yeah. that's a cross street there. Franklin and and. Uh, yeah, but the company name that used to do their IT work was Beck Computer Systems, and I worked for them in the late '90s as well. Mm -hmm. And they used to do all the IT server infrastructure for the Church of Scientology. It's an interesting building. Mm -hmm. So there should be no doubt in people's minds that things like this exist, you know? And then is there any kind of crossover, similarities, connections to things like the Trilateral Commission or the Council um, on Foreign Relations? I or? would imagine because from my observation all these people are connected through their networks. But even if they aren't connected, I'm just saying these are things that exist, yeah. you know. Trilateral Commission, it's not a it's not a bowling team, it's no. not a corporation, or maybe yeah. it is, it's it's but it's these are think tanks, they're groups of people with certain ways of thinking that have the ability to influence the world. Right. They're they're almost organizations that are specifically designed to influence the world. Uh, yeah. there's there's a new show on Crowdsource the Truth called The Audacity Files. And just earlier in the week, uh, in the second episode, my co-host on that show, Jan Weinberg, spoke about the Business Roundtable, mm -hmm. which is essentially a fraternity of the most powerful CEOs in the country who get together to collectively advance their 
agendas, essentially. They do. And the track to get into things like that is uh, the difficult part, and it's how they maintain their secrecy. Right. Is you go through all that work to get in, you're not going to throw it away with revealing one secret. Right, and they and they and that's the indoctrination. They're that's bringing the, in like-minded people. Mm -hmm. Hey, all these other people are dopes. You're a you know a, a thought you're leader. You're you're a part of this elite group. You're going to be a millionaire. You're going to be a billionaire. You're going to control this technology, this industry, whatever it is. Everything's going to go great for you, and we need to do this for the benefit of all these stupid underling masses or whatever. And then yeah. that line keeps getting pushed further and further and the people, you know, I mean, you, I, I'm obviously I haven't been in there, I don't know exactly, but I'm just kind of visualizing how something like this could work and it how does work. people get involved but in it. But there's a, you know, as, we'll, as we get more into how these groups have infected my life throughout the years, because they never went away even when I left, mm -hmm. they never disappeared, because once you know about them, they always keep you on marker, as they call it. Uh, so once you know about them, there's never any going back, uh, which means everyone who's watching, once you know about them, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. um, but part of my experience in viewing these groups is that the only people that really benefit are the extreme alpha personalities. Mm -hmm. I saw these groups break up more families. I, in the teen seminars that I used to, to do, mm -hmm. I saw so many kids get led into drug addiction mm -hmm. and just into everything. I think we've got uh, some medical attention being time for vitals? applied here. Yes. We're doing trying to do this one. I got the band on. Oh cool. But I can't push the button. Would you like me to move? This one? Yeah. So as uh, everyone knows, Quinn is here in the hospital. He's recovering from a spontaneous collapsed lung. And uh, we're just going to... Check I'll, my vitals. Real I'll quick. vamp a little bit here while they're yeah. checking the vitals. But uh, it's a fascinating conversation, Quinn. And I mean, again, I think that um, like so many things, when you know it well and you just kind of gloss over it, a lot of people hearing it for the first time might not be able to absorb it, might not be able to understand it fully. Mm -hmm. uh, it might, it's difficult. Yeah, it might sound uh, a little yeah. bit um, hard to believe or a little bit ridiculous, but we're starting to get the idea of what you're talking about in terms of these secret societies. So yeah. the one that you were in that was behind the book, The Secret. Thank you. Was there a name for it? Yeah, it's the Psy Seminars. The Psy Seminars, OK. Yeah, and they, they had several different names, but most, most of the time they used uh, Cyrillic or Greek alphabets to represent themselves. So each one of the different groups would have be represented by an alpha, theta, epsilon, you know, like the fraternal organizations. Uh, so this one was the psi. They were the psi, PSI. And they've been following you since you left because they're concerned them were, about them were one of their their affiliates uh, because, like you, we've established, it's a fraternal organization that has secrets to protect. And the original owners trace back. You, you can actually trace back Thomas Wilhite, the guy who started Psy Seminars. You can actually do research and find connections to his involvement in the early psychological operations at the CIA. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of this stuff can be traced back to come from there. And of course, you told us earlier that you're not really in touch with your family. Are they still part of this organization? No, they're not, to my knowledge. Uh, they weren't, they weren't uh, the right type of thinkers. Okay, but you're, you're disconnected from them. And of course, you've spoken on your own channel, mm -hmm. Quinn Michaels on YouTube, and elsewhere, yeah. you've spoken about your son, and now, let's talk a little bit about that. From my son's perspective, they are still involved. That with part of your family is. Yeah, but to my knowledge, they weren't. That's why I said to my knowledge, they weren't. But when we start bringing in my son's aspect of the story, everything changes. And it becomes really crazy to listen to and almost impossible to believe. Well, let's, let's start stepping through yeah. it and see where um, we can go with it. Uh, if you're comfortable with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No, I just had to breathe and I had like the tube. Um, that's that's kind of where it got weird because uh, I've never really known my son. I wasn't there when he was born. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but why were you not there when he was born? They didn't call me. Who's they? His mother and uh, her father. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to explain in a way that makes sense. So I want to like make sure that I'm extra careful about it because my son's birthday is in a couple days, and mm -hmm. they kind of took him away from me. So I haven't seen him in a long time. Do you think he'll see this video? Uh, if people share it, um, they will, because he's the one that told me about the depths of this secret society's involvement in my life or this fraternal organization. And that's the same one you've already told us about, or it's, it's another one? It's indicated as the same. It's the same ones who tried to recruit me when I was 18 have continued to follow my work through the years. And so uh, on November 22nd of 2015... November 22nd? Yeah of 2015, um, I had spent a year uh, going through my Buddhist practice with my son every other weekend and trying to teach him about my Buddhist way of life mm -hmm. because he kept coming over to my house saying that his mom would say I was crazy, that Buddhism isn't real, that I'm a nut job and I shouldn't be listened to. So I had a lot of really difficult scenarios with my son every other weekend where I would try to be a good father and he would treat me horribly, mm -hmm. more horribly than any child should ever treat their father. Well, I don't think that's uncommon in divorced families. We or, were never divorced. Well, you were never married, but yeah. when so, there's a separation between the mother and father, <laughs> that type of psychological... So in my situation on November 22nd, yeah. I had just spent a year making like this Buddhist video for my son so he could see that I really was a Buddhist. And I showed it to him, and he sat there and he just said, I messed up. That was his words, was I messed up. And so this was what started me into the story of his real family and their involvement and his involvement. What do you mean his real family? Uh, Not I, you and his mother? No, us, but the real story behind it. Like, mm -hmm. uh, unknown to me, my son was being taken to animal sacrifices Mm -hmm. according to him, mm -hmm. and we'll get into that, by his grandfather. Uh, my son's grandfather was reinforcing the belief to my son that I wasn't his real father for unknown various reasons. So these people had initiated a slander campaign against me right. to keep me away from my son, and up until November 22nd of 2015, I was told that my son had ADD and was had learning disability problems and mm -hmm. was going to these doctors and then my son started telling me that that wasn't true that that was just all a cover story to keep a secret that they were a part of this secret society sacrificing that, animals sacrificing animals and making deals what kind of deals uh, well my son told me that his mother in exchange for 20 million dollars would agree to spend the duration of my son's childhood ruining my life. $20 million? Yeah. Have you seen evidence that she's received $20 million? No, no. But my son has rewritten up the contracts and he's reiterated that, that I've sat down with him several times and illustrated to him that these stories would ruin people's lives just like most likely. If people share this, this is going to get back to my son's mom and she's going to initiate more against me for being public. Do you believe that she's received $20 million? No, but I believe that her life is handled. What do uh, you mean? Uh, like I told you, I've never had a physical conversation with her, and she won't. Never? But what about when you met her? I mean, you about this. Well, we did, never... yeah, no, but ever since my son was born, uh, since or then. our son okay. was born, yeah. we've never had a conversation on how we want our son to be raised, the religious beliefs. How long were you together with her before? Eight weeks. Eight two and a half months. So it's sort of an unplanned yeah, But anyway, pregnancy. and at every turn, uh, this woman has found lame excuses that I can't defend against to use the legal system to make me look bad. Very, very much in the same way that people do, certain people on the internet are slandering me. Exactly right. the same way. Right. And so it indicates things. And, but my son was the one that told me that his mother was a member of this secret society that had technology that could see into the future. They had the technology to control the internet. Well, I gotta stop you right there, because the technology to see into the future, that sounds quite hard to believe. But not when you look at quantum computing and future probabilities. 
and you adapt the way a kid says things to other things. So he knew about high-level technology before the fact. And we have seen newspaper articles that say that Facebook is trying to develop predictive algorithms. So maybe he's talking about something like that? No, my son was telling me this years before any of these companies had news articles out. My son was telling me this stuff in 2014. But, okay, but conceivably, if 2017 there's a news article about it, that technology, that predictive uh, mass data mining, predictive, you know, someone, someone sees you go to Starbucks but every morning at 8.30, they can predict that you're going to go there tomorrow. How would a 12-year-old who doesn't ha even have a computer in his house know about this? Well, someone would tell him about it. Or he'd go somewhere and see it. Okay. Okay. So your son tells you that... He also told me about the underground cities and the secret labs. And he also told me about how the secret society gets people in different countries. Yeah, see, and I remember when I first started listening to you on YouTube before we met, I would hear about underground cities and secret societies. And when mm -hmm. taken collectively like that, it's like this guy's a nut, underground city, secret society. But as we go through and we start to talk, I mean, you say a computer that can see into the future, that sounds crazy. But you talk about an article where Facebook or Google or whoever is, I mean, people have seen this. I've spoken to many people about this. Obviously, if you are searching for a Sony camera and then later that day you're on the Internet and there's all these ads for Sony cameras coming up, everybody's experienced that. I do believe I've experienced where I might even speak about something and then ads will start coming up and people have even told me they've had experiences where they might even be thinking about buying shoes or something and start getting ads for shoes. Yeah. So is this somehow behavioral patterning, predictive? It's predictive modeling is what it is. And That's a science. That's not that's magic. That's a science. Yeah, it's based on decision model programming. It's mm -hmm. anything, it's predictive modeling. And the way How can they know that I need shoes if I'm thinking about buying shoes? Exactly, and then how would a 12-year-old kid whose mom doesn't even have a smartphone or anything more than a, anything newer than a five-year-old laptop in the house know about this advanced technology? He knew about their advanced robots they were making. He knew about how in certain elevators could have certain keys, could take you to the underground facilities. We've heard about this in the Luxor Hotel, yeah. apparently. So my son, who's a little kid who lives in suburban Oregon, mm -hmm. somehow knew the intricate details of this entire network, and that's really what I'm out researching. Um, that's really what I, I'm doing, is I'm not doing this for fame or, or fortune. I'm, I'm really out just researching the story my son told me. To verify if to it's verify. true or to and, reconnect with him or what? Uh, well, to verify it mm -hmm. because he's a minor and he is potentially being involved in illegal activity. What, what's illegal about it? Well, I guess animal sacrifices. The, the animal sacrifices, the emotional abuse, the not being allowed to be around his father, not being able to talk to other kids. I mean, he, he's very, very different when you talk to him. And there's a lot of things that, you know, like that are, for example, he's not allowed to go outside. He's not allowed to have friends. The last time I was interacting with him. They tell you that's not the truth, but yet when you see what happens when he tries to, it becomes obvious that it's almost like uh, they've programmed him not to want it. Like, my son, when I last saw him, he would sit there and do nothing for hours. Come over to your house and just do nothing. And sit there and do nothing. Uh -huh. It was like he was... Big, How old is he right now? He's going to be 14 in a couple of days. But he would literally come over to my house, sit there and do nothing, and then when I would try to talk to him, all he would want to talk about was this weird, fantastical, magic type way of thinking that he was learning from the people around him. He'd want to talk about machines that could see into the future. He would want to talk about the secret society that his family was a member of because he was just happy to finally be able to talk about it with me after keeping it a secret for so long. Hmm. You know, he wanted to constantly talk about how the secret society told him that they kidnapped me when I was a baby and they owned me. 
Talk about that for a minute, because you've told me about that privately, yeah. but I don't know if people know about that. Um, according to my son, that's the reason why I don't have close relations with my family, is because they're not my family. And when you asked your mother and father? They, my mom changed her phone number. Didn't answer the question. She just hung up the phone. I haven't spoken to her in five years. As a result of asking that? Yeah, three years, five years, I forget. It's been years. Um, I tried to communicate with my father about it. He pretty much laughed at me and would only respond with a text message. What did the text message say? I don't know. Hmm. And of course, you know, like we were discussing previously, there's a lot of people whose families have disagreements over religion, marital choices, career choices, yeah. personal differences. But you would think something like being in the hospital with this very serious, Collapse possibly mom. fatal injury and... Yeah, or you have your grandson is saying that they're having secret meetings with you and... You're... Well, that aside, I could see them thinking, this is nonsense, Quinn's gone off the deep end, but yeah. you're here in the hospital, you call them, they don't even... Answer. I mean, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, and I don't mean to say that I think it's nonsense. I believe what you're saying. Yeah, and... no, but the... The indicator of it, one of the big indicators of it is, is that my mother, bef before this story from my son started coming out, yeah. she was the most world-renowned professional quilter in the world. Right. And ever since this came out, she doesn't even make YouTube videos anymore. Your mother used to make YouTube videos about quilting. Yeah. She had one of the largest subscriber bases for quilting videos on YouTube. Wow. But ever since this story started coming out from my son, she hasn't made a new video in three years. So conceivably, that's because she knows it's true and she's laying low, or we could that's speculate all like. day. But why would someone whose career depends on traveling and making quilt all of a sudden... Stop. Stop. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so your son tells you this. When's the last time you saw your son? Over a year ago. And no communication? No, they... they his mother filed a, a court case against me saying I was bringing satanic ways of life to him and needed to be kept away from him for being a danger when my son was the one who told me his grandpa and his mom were the ones introducing him to the satanic way of life. So pretty much they do what people are doing is they're blaming me for what they're doing and because I wasn't in a position to defend myself, I was out collecting proof to his story they were able to make it so I couldn't get near him. And does he tell you anything that ties this in with, you know, Pedogate, Pizzagate, any of that kind of? Um, the people he said that he met with in private that were taking surveillance of my life uh, told him that they made the TV shows. What TV shows? All of them. They told him that if this came out, the TV would go away because they make all the TV shows. So. Well, that sounds like something you say to a child to scare them. Well, but when, if you heard the parts where he said they were showing pictures of a big house they were going to get with all the celebrity friends and, and everything, it, it becomes a real, real abstract thing to, to even believe for myself. And that's, right. why, uh, that's why in 2015, that's why I went to the FBI. Okay, so you went to the FBI. November 30th, a week after I was told about the secret society. And what did they say? What did you say to them? How did they uh, respond? I told them the whole story. Um, and they told me to hire my own investigator. Why? Because they can't comment on pending or they I can't see. comment on investigations. Did they seem interested or disinterested? They took my evidence. Did they believe you, you think? What sort of evidence did you give them? Uh, my son drew up one of their uh, contracts that had been hanging on his mom's wall for years, one of their membership contracts. Drew it up, meaning he wrote it out or yeah. he presented the a, actual? It was a small contract that each one of the members has to sign that has things in it like, those who reveal the covenant secrets will face dire consequences, the covenant or death. But he rewrote it from memory or he yeah, brought it? he rewrote it from memory because he had seen it so many times on our wall. Wow. And it said things like covenant of death. The covenant or death. I see. But so it's, still, that's language that seems to be part of probably beyond... Uh, a 12-year-old. Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, there were other lines in it that said those who reveal the covenant secrets will face dire consequences. Uh, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, uh, which is an exact tweet from Michael Jackson's son from prior. 
Really? Yeah. So there's a lot of these bylines in the covenant contract, as I call it, mm -hmm. um, that uh, coincide with the way this, these people would work. Okay. They would need a death contract to protect their secrets when dealing with their people. All right. So let's bridge the gap from all this to what's happening now in your research with artificial intelligence, our trip to the dune, the deep underground neutrino yeah. experiment, the follow-up at these, Fermi Labs. These and are all just indicators of me following the leads my son gave me about their underground science experiments. Um, and to me, this is their large group of people trying to just keep their secrets. You know, one thing that we didn't get a chance to cover in South Dakota that we learned really I think minutes before we left, was that there actually is an entire city underground there in, uh, was it uh, Lead or? Uh, it was around there, the, the mining, the mining What was it, Deadwood, the, it might have been under Deadwood, the yeah. mining town where apparently Chinese immigrants lived during the gold yeah. mine. It's a whole city, they said, underground there. Yeah, so there's, there's remnants of cities everywhere underground in mining towns. Hudson told me there was an underground city in Las Vegas. Yeah with some sort of bingo thing where you can win a panda. Yeah. And I was told that there's an underground city in Las Vegas by another person as well. Uh, not a real panda, of course, but some yeah. sort of highly coveted Yeah, I, I was told by another person panda. there's a city under Vegas where you can literally get anything you want. Right, right. Okay. So multiple sources are, are who are seemingly not connected or, or validating. And right. um, that's kind of what happened with my son's story because the last time I talked to him um, they weren't very nice who they his mother and family mm -hmm. and his grandmother I they they stopped allowing me communication so I got really upset mm -hmm. when they wouldn't let me talk to him and I started reaching out to all his family members saying where's my son I want to talk to my son mm -hmm. pretty much all of my Kids, grandma, grandpa, mom, pretty much told me to go F myself. Mm -hmm. And so these people took my son away from me, and then yeah. they used the court system to file a fraudulent case accusing me of things I didn't do that I couldn't defend against because I didn't have the resources. It's funny, we know some other people that like to try to do that. Yeah, so my goal, my real goal is to this is I don't care about these people's secret society. I, I think they suck. Mm -hmm. They involved my kid, and that was their biggest mistake. Because they took my kid through their experiments, they brainwashed him, mm -hmm. they told him how it all worked, they made him think that it was the only way him and his family were ever going to get rich, and then when that didn't work, they had his mom file a court case against me, accusing me of what they were doing. Mm, we know other people that like to do that, too. Yeah. So it's the same M.O. every time. Right. Right. Right? Now, I won't even tell you my kid's mom's name. That's fine. Because I, I want to protect my kid. My kid doesn't have my last name, so you can't go find my kid. Right. But I know she's out there watching, and I know all the people in her secret society that have been after me and the people around me for the last eight months are watching. Right. Because there's no way a 12-year-old should have ever known even 1% of what this kid told me, and it should have never fact-checked. Well, right. We went there, and certainly... It's there. It's there. So I haven't had one instance of what my son told me not check out, and that's the problem. So people on the Internet, if they don't go check it and they say it's fake, or they say this is a LARP, or they say I'm making this up or we're making this up, to me, it just seems like the stupidest way to think. Well, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon for yeah. sure because, you know, um, since you and I have been working together, I think there's been a lot more attention on this research. Yeah. Certainly crowdsource the truth. Subscriptions are growing. The Quinn Michaels channel on YouTube has been Exposure growing. Exposure is growing. Exposure is growing. And that's what I told my son that I was going to do. Well, and as we, even you and I are talking about this, and I'm understanding it better, I'm sure people who are watching are having a better understanding of this. Um, certainly, uh, 
the word is getting out, and if there are people that don't want others to know about this, what we're doing is in direct contrast to what they want. And yeah. we have seen, you know, people call them trolls. Okay, so whatever they are, we have seen people popping up, putting these ideas out on the internet that, you know, basically saying negative things about you. And it is in such stark contrast to actual reality, for instance. Uh, and again, I, I don't I don't want to address this because it's upsetting me. I want to clarify for the huge numbers of people that are looking for information on this research who come to it, you know, today, yesterday, last week. And that's what these people are trying to do. They're trying to put out false information to confuse those who, who are potentially, they see. The seekers. Right. They see the tremendous rate at which our reach is growing in sharing this information with people who want the truth mm -hmm. and who can watch you and I speak about exactly what we're talking about right here. And, Live. Right. And we're not making this up. I mean, we, this is a hospital. We didn't stage this. No. We didn't, you know, get doctors to come in here and, you know, stick needles and tubes. And, or do vital checks. Or so, I mean, to say that this is being done to raise money uh, is quite absurd because you are quite clearly a very skilled computer programmer. I'm running these live streams. I mean, if you or I wanted to leave and create companies, I'm sure I could make more money in New York Rainbow. City advertising, you know, hey, you know, do a live yeah. stream for your corporate event or whatever than coming on yeah. here and asking people to help us in a crowdsource effort. Well, to, to me, make it simple it's more about raising the awareness doing the right thing yeah and raising the awareness sometimes does take money you have health matters that come up you well, have just driving around driving buying around. food having yeah. a place to live but if at the end of the day it raises awareness and people can look at something with more honest eyes and more accepting eyes then it's a better day for people right right and for me as a father I have a son who I haven't seen most of his life. Mm -hmm. right? I wasn't there when he took his first steps. I, I never changed a dirty diaper. Well, that's the action of evil working yeah. against you. And, and so, so for me, I made a promise to my son. Mm -hmm. right? And this is what people don't get about me. is When my son started telling me this story, I sat him down and I said, you start telling me this story, you can't go back. I said to him, I said, if you tell me this story, I'm going to walk this story forward so far that you will never believe. So you better make sure that you're telling me the truth. And I said this to my son. Well, and if he isn't, you would find that out too. Yeah. And I, so far in three years, four years, it's always proven correct. There's always someone out there breaking you down the same way as before. There's always some psychological operation being run against you. There's always some weird health problem you're having that can't be explained. This isn't the first time I've had strange health problems. I mean, I've been dealing with these weird health problems every year for years. Every year, it's some weird, undescribable health problem I get. Hmm. You know, whether it be like swollen ankles or collapsed lungs, it's always some strange freaking health problem, at least once a year. It's unexplained. Let's talk a little bit more, though, about some of this metadata that's happening mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Like, in mm -hmm. other words, when you were first uh, admitted to the hospital here and it was unknown, you know, what your costs were going to be, I reached out to our audience and said, hey, mm -hmm. if people want to help Quinn, send Quinn money directly. Mm -hmm. And we see people on Twitter and elsewhere spending that, taking my words and trying to get people to believe that I was somehow trying to raise money for myself. Which you weren't. On the basis of your injuries. Yeah. I specifically told people, don't start new fundraising operations. Don't send money to me. I showed your links. Yeah. I wanted people to send money to the entities that you control so that there was no misdirection of yeah. funds and, and there was and no misappropriation of funds. Not only was that very kind of you to offer that, it was very helpful because without just you offering to do that, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, have help right now. I mean, my intention with communicating with you is, I believe we're friends, so I wanted to communicate with you about my health. You offered to use your resources to help me correct some of the financial woes of this horrible situation. 
We are friends, by we the way. We are friends. Um, it's really a shameful thing that people on the internet that don't know us... Right. Make statements as if they do know us or that they have some information about what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, over the last year, you're probably the person I've spoken with the most in person. Right? I, I, my research is very private because it involves my son. Mm -hmm. Every person I seem to tell about my son in this research turns out to be an agent and turns on me just like the last guy who ended up on the Defango show. Oh, I, you said it. We didn't want to say it. <laughs> I said it right there on purpose because I want people to connect it. I don't really want to give him credit, but, but he does seem to be showing up frequently so to he was, that mess per, with stuff. That person was the last person I told about my son's involvement in this creepy secret society. Right after I told this person, he turned on me, and the first place he went was the person who's been attacking me the most on the internet. Erasing names, that was the pattern. Someone I thought was my friend, I told him about my son's involvement. Right. He immediately turns on me and then goes to the person who's attacking me the most. So, but we're talking about it, so let's talk about it. And the pattern is there. These people show up and they say, hey, I'm your friend. I'm going to help you do something. Yeah. I'm going to be, you know, generous in some way. And then they immediately turn that situation to make it look as if you have done something to hurt them. Now, that is the definition of gaslighting, to yeah. convince someone, you know, like this is the behavior of an abuser, yeah. to convince the victim that they've brought the abuse on themselves yeah. or they've done something to deserve it or whatever. Yeah. And certainly I haven't been making videos claiming that other people are gaslighting. We see these people no. making videos about us, the, the, saying that the, you and I are up to the, something. The, the person I, I speak about who's been attacking me the most, um, I'll just say his name once, he actually made a video accusing me of drugging my kid when I used a voice disguiser so people wouldn't know my kid's real voice. He spun that, supposedly a very technologically advanced person who should have been able to identify that to I was know using that a, it's voice a voice disguiser. disguiser. Right. Instead of an, identifying it as a voice disguise, he made his entire audience believe that I was drugging my kid. Right. Well, this is the standard operating procedure of this individual, yeah. to make a false statement based on some piece of what he considers evidence, show something, yeah. make a false statement about it, and then drive that point home so much. Through his network of. See, but I don't believe that that's an organic audience that believes that. It's possible that there are no, some people mechanical, in there. It's a mechanical audience. Yes, people who work with him, work for him. We've seen George Webb's brother be it's involved a large in this. network. Okay. And these people are their, uh, the ones that I've found, the un, even the unnamed ones, these are their elites. What do you mean? The, these are the their elite hackers. These are the ones that they specifically train to mold. And you mean hack the people reality. that they put out front? Cedars, thought cedars. They're out front. The yeah. people behind the scenes put these guys out front. Yeah. Now we've heard that language from someone. Yeah. Who's utilizing the legal system to try to damage me? Yeah. When I said that person came on our program and committed fraud by lying to our audience to steal money. So that's what they do. There's a whole huge network of secret people hiding behind this isolated group of visual people. Right. And they never challenge, you know, in other words, when someone says, oh, you know, Jason worked on X-Men, so therefore he knows Brian Singer, I challenge that because yeah. I've never met Brian Singer. I don't know Brian Singer. I challenge anyone who says that to provide some proof of a photograph of me with him, an email correspondence between us, any indication of proof that I've ever met that individual. And no one does that. Never. I challenge their accusations with facts. They don't do that. When I say Robert David Steele has committed fraud, here's the evidence in the form of his lies that he used to raise money, mm -hmm. in the form of his 501c3 tax-exempt or organization was not registered, in the state in which he was soliciting money. He doesn't challenge my accusations because he knows they're factual. They misdirect, they redirect, and they begin to lie. So in the same way, this is the reason I'm pointing all this out is because this is a pattern and a practice that's got to be broken. Yeah. Whether it's being used against Michael Flynn by corrupt elements of the FBI, and we should also clarify some statements that you've made about corruption within the government and within the FBI 
I think we both believe that the United States government and the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation and the House of Representatives and all these things, they generally are, and we hope that they will be, decent and good organizations that are here to serve us all honestly. Serve the good. But the problem is the corrupt few individuals that get in there, that infiltrate. Get into the positions of control. Right. And there is where the corruption yeah. lies. And that is what we are trying to expose. Yeah, because as a whole, um, if you're an American citizen and you believe that your federal government is corrupt to the level that the internet is conspiring to make people believe, it's, the, the, we should all be standing up. So the, the government can't be as corrupt as the YouTube conspiracy theorists want you to believe. Based on my analysis, there is a certain percentage that is corrupt. There is a certain percentage that's trying to um, reveal that corruption. Right. And there's a biggest percentage of people who just want to go to their job every day and know that they're doing a good job and that they're servicing the future of a free nation. Right. Um, because yeah. it would be counterproductive for people to sign up to protect and to serve and to not protect and serve. Right. Well, I think that, uh, you know, a big part of it is that so many people find the concepts and the ideas that we're discussing right now so repulsive, so... Mm -hmm difficult to digest that they automatically reject them, even people within these organizations. Well, and that's the nature of the battle of good versus evil. Right. And we've been having conversations with Robin Gritz, who, of course, was a special agent, a supervisory special agent mm -hmm. at the FBI, involved in very high-level operations. In my personal interactions with her, she seems extremely sincere, mm -hmm. uh, extremely dedicated. and. She, you know, we're starting to get a clearer picture of who some of these corrupt individuals within the FBI are. Mm -hmm. We see Andrew McCabe being questioned behind closed doors. James Comey, of course, has been fired. Robert Mueller has been implicated in a lot of crazy shenanigans involving investigations, involving transportation of uranium. We haven't even gotten too deep into what he may or may not have known about 9-11. We see yeah. this guy, Peter Stroke, whatever his name is. So, you know, if we've got the four top people or, or the 20, Robin Gritz has referred to as many as 20 people who she feels were part of this. They can control the whole scene. Well, right. And there's thousands of people in the FBI who maybe are, look at Robin Gritz, when she stood up and tried to, yeah, handle this. They threw her out. And if we go back to the trip that I took to Oxford, England with Patricia Negron back in June or July, whenever yeah. that was, and it's interesting to see how that trip was sabotaged by a deceitful liar who we've been talking about where he specifically called Oxford and then boasted about doing that to lie to them and tell them that I had some intention to do harm to Eric Braverman. He did that not because he's trying to reveal the truth. He did that because he's trying to prevent me. So you're telling me the same person that attacks me has also sabotaged your op. Your well, and it's clear. It's clear. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are people who support this individual who are either so misguided and so ignorant of facts that they must educate themselves or withdraw, or they're working for him, or they're him under fake internet personalities, but... Or there is team. His team of operatives, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a limited number of possibilities for who these people could be, but if my purpose is to go to Oxford, England, to speak to Eric Braverman about what he might have known about Seth Rich, what he might have known about DNC leaks, what he might have known about the Clinton Foundation, and just sit here with him, as I am with you, asking questions, conducting an interview, why would someone intentionally tell the Blavatnik School of Government that I intend to do harm to Eric Braverman, and then why would they make a video boasting about it? To keep you from talking about it. Of course. To prevent us from finding the truth. Mm -hmm. That's the actual truth. Yeah. And there's video evidence to show that. Yeah. There's a lot. And that, that's why I know that the agencies in the future will be responsible. Because those people are good people. And they signed up to be of help.
I want to point out another way in which this individual tries to deceive. He claims to be donating to you via Litecoin mm -hmm. and Bitcoin and things like this over two or three occasions in the past several days or a week or two. Mm -hmm. This person has made these financial payments to you and to crowdsource the truth in the amount of a dollar sixty-seven or you know seventeen cents or something like that. There are transaction fees associated with this, so it obviously is not logical that someone would pay ten or fifteen dollars yeah. to send a dollar sixty-seven. You or mean like ninety-nine cents? Ninety-nine cents to someone in the hospital. Now, yeah. what kind of a person would do that, even if? This was totally brought about by cigarette smoking and altitude changes and everything we've uh, been questioning. Is this possible yeah. that this could be done with an electromagnetic radiation weapon? Even if this was purely brought on by happenstance, coincidence, and poor health, why would someone be so cold and so cruel Just to, as to taunt you with a uh, a financial contribution of pennies, someone who uh, doesn't have, for whatever reason, enough money to pay the medical bills associated with this condition, you're going to need to stay in this town for several days close Actually, to the hospital. A couple weeks. I'm going to have to stay here for a couple weeks. Okay, so that's going to be hotel stays. There's money that's going to be need to be spent. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me, people should be I think something disconnected. The heart rate's not showing any longer. There you go. It'll readjust. It's interesting to me that this individual is making such a concerted effort to attack the financial lifeline of you, of Crowdsource the Truth. I mean, obviously, CNN, The New York Times, Washington Post, when they report on train derailments, terrorist attacks, murders, death, destruction, do they terminate advertising on those days? They still no. need money to run their operations. No, but you need something to attack. You know, when you're attacking a person and you can't generally uh, assassinate their character anymore because they've already gone through all the character assassination attempts against us, can't do that anymore because then that becomes obvious. Because people start going, why do you keep attacking these dudes' character? <laughs> These guys aren't even mentioning you. Why do you keep attacking these guys? These guys are doing good research that factually checks out. Why are you attacking them? Right. You know, because that's, that's one thing that like you and I observe in our research is a lot of very intelligent people that work at universities and work in laboratories and work in places where we're doing research, they communicate with us by sending us confirming research to what we're doing, right. not telling us we're stupid. Well, and there are people who sometimes disagree. I've yeah. gotten emails from people who have said that GPU crypto mining is old technology, and it's all using ASICs, mm -hmm. which is what? Applied, what does ASICs stand for? I forget, let me look well, We can up. look that up. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a basically a, not a computer running an operating system yeah. with a graphics processing unit in it. It's a dedicated machine for cryptocurrency mining. And I'm not denying that that technology exists, but I have seen many, many videos, some of which have been produced in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. talking about how to build rigs and networks and join and mining pools with GPU cards and things like that, that. If you're talking Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum, you would need a hardware miner. Yes. But if you're talking in the realm of a casino who's... Well, when you say a hardware miner, you mean an ASIC? Yeah, like a big farming hardware. You would need much more than just a GPU. But if you're talking an isolated individual cryptocurrency that may be created by the individual the entities, itself. it still would be GPU. But I've seen videos, if you're Quinn. Doing, if you're doing a blockchain, that has an AI that needs to run calculations. The AI needs GPU, so you would naturally use a blockchain GPU. You wouldn't use an ASICs. Let me ask you this, though. Because I've seen videos very recently, guys with, uh, you know, 70, 1080i GPU cards, mining Zcash, mining Litecoin, mining Ethereum, why would you not be able to use 70 slot machines in That's a That's the logic. Why wouldn't you? 
It seems like you would, right? Yeah. Especially if you're mining your own off-market currency. Right. That you plan to reveal in the Later. future. Later. Right. Yeah. So there's a problem there with the logic. I mean, it, it seems to me, and then someone else sent me what was, you know, arguably valid uh, alternative opinion or uh, piece of uh, information about it, saying that the theory didn't make sense because it would cost so much money in terms of electricity to have Not the Bitcoin the mining power. thing in Chicago. Not with all the green power. Well, but that aside even, what I'm saying is here we've got a casino and let's mm -hmm. say a casino is obviously a business. P casinos have been around forever mm -hmm. and have made money, but I, I would imagine a I'll, fairly I'll pull something up for you right now relating so we don't have to go down a rabbit hole. Sure. But I would imagine a fairly substantial problem for a casino that has slot machines is they want to be open 24 hours because that's the nature of that business. They want to keep all the slot machines on at all times because they don't want a customer to come to a slot machine and have it be turned off and walk away. Mm -hmm. So they've already got this sunk cost of all this electricity. If the slot machines are only being used half of the time, what could we possibly do with them for the rest of the time to earn some money? And I mean, I was looking at guys making videos where they're calculating, you know, X dollars per day from mining whichever cryptocurrency on a given GPU card, et cetera. And it seems like that's a calculation the casinos would want to know about. You've pointed out in that video that we did uh, right outside the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. that from the WikiLeaks emails, Andreessen Horowitz met with... Oh, that was their own email. James Muir. That was their, their Ocean's directives where they were meeting with MGM Grand about Bitcoin. Right. So obviously, they're talking about something. What if they said, hey, you guys have all this computational power sitting around, idle. I guarantee you they did. I feel pretty confident that they would have at least discussed it. How because could they, they were not talking be to doing MGM it? about Bitcoin in 2015. Right. right. They had to have because why else would you talk to a casino about Stripe payments and cryptocurrency? Right. What else would you have to talk about? I don't know. And it's being talked about by the guy who invented Netscape Navigator or mm -hmm. the web browser. Mm -hmm. So these are the highest functioning people in technology. Mm -hmm. These are not kids building little miners. Yeah. These are the people who invented the internet, yet kids who are building miners, although at a disadvantage, we have to start understanding the people who built the internet. And that's the difference because a lot of people are relating to what they understand about technology to individualized ICO coins. They're not comparing that to an architecture that's being built by the people who built the internet. Right. And that, that's the difference of perspective that I, I think we really need to start getting into to understand this is we have to start assuming the perception of the person who built the internet. What would they be building? Not the kid in China who's just getting on the internet. Right. Not the McAfee guy who's building his mining farm. We're, we're talking the people who built PayPal. Yeah. The people who built your web browser. The people who built cloud computing. The people who built the core of the Linux operating system. Yeah. These are not tiny little people who just build things in their garage. These are the guys that built the base of all the technology that we use in the world today. What are they capable of when no one's looking? Or when people are looking at something they don't want them to be looking at. Exactly. Well, Quinn, you know, it's really interesting because I think this conversation that we've just had right now sheds a whole new light on all the research that you've done. Mm -hmm. And I think now is the perfect time for us to wrap it up because your dinner yes. is arriving. It but, is. But um, we're going to carry on with these conversations throughout the course of the next couple days. And uh, I think I'm going to give you some time here to rest and enjoy your dinner. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone for watching. Thanks, I, everyone, for your support. I want to remind people to go and subscribe to Quinn Michaels on YouTube. If you aren't already subscribed, I'm going to put the link to Quinn Michaels' channel into the description when we're done. And no one should ever send any kind of financial support that puts them in a financially compromised situation. Yeah. But if you feel like you'd like to help Quinn, there are links to his 
financial support options on the Quinn Michaels YouTube channel. Yeah. You can join the Rahula Club. Uh, you can join me on Patreon. You can follow him on Patreon.com by searching for Rahula Club. And uh, you can also uh, follow him on Twitter at Quinn Michaels. Now, there's a message that's just come in here that I want to look at briefly before we sign off. Um, but I do want to give you an opportunity to rest. Quinn has just had his third surgery yesterday in his recovery from this spontaneous collapsed lung. Um, Mr. Hudson is sending prayers to you, Quinn. Thank you. And messages that I am getting from him and others in our network indicate that many of these criminal elements that you and I have been pursuing, the day is coming. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Enjoy dinner, Quinn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching, everybody.